Uh, I'm John Broderick. I'm the dean of the law school. And I'm going to introduce the program briefly this morning. But before I do that, I wonder if I could have a show of hands. How many here this morning have never been in this law school building before? Well, you won't be able to say that tomorrow. <laughs> So it's great to have. <laughs> great to have you here. I, I, I'm the dean of the law school. I've been here now about 22 months, and as I was saying to the group at dinner last night, when I became dean here, I I knew one other dean of an American law school, and he, in that case, he called me, and said, "I want to give you a little information about your new job," and I said, "That'd be great because I would be happy to accept it." He said, being the dean of a law school is a lot like being the groundskeeper in a cemetery. And that didn't sound real appealing. And so I said, well, how would that work? He said, there are a lot of people below you, but no one's listening. <laughs> <laughs> some, days, uh, some days it feels that way. In any event, welcome to this program. I think you will enjoy it. We have some very distinguished speakers here this morning. And so I want to thank the speakers who have come. I want to thank the law students from this school who are helping to facilitate, and I want to thank the outside facilitators as well. I know there are a number of teachers here, there are a number of citizens and lawyers, and it's wonderful to see people gathering on a Saturday morning on a topic such as this, which runs through our entire life. Almost two centuries ago, Thomas Jefferson, of whom I'm very fond because I went to his university in Charlottesville, Virginia. So I know a bit about Jefferson, but almost two centuries ago, he said the following. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Those words could not be more accurate. Some years ago, the National Center for State Courts conducted a survey of both adults and young people. Two-thirds of those over the age of 18 could identify by name the three judges on American Idol. 15% could identify by name the Chief Justice of the United States. Among the younger people, slightly more people could name the three stooges than could name the three branches of government. Thomas Jefferson was right. I'll tell you a brief story. When I was Chief Justice, I spent a fair amount of time in the legislature. And so I would go over every two years, at least, to testify about the judicial branch budget. And so in a decidedly tough economic year, I testified before a subcommittee of House Finance. And they recommended a budget mark, which was better than the governor's budget mark, so I was grateful. And so two weeks later, I was in the State House jumping into an elevator. And a member of that subcommittee was in the elevator. He was a very nice guy and a friend of the courts. And so I thanked him for the budget mark. And he looked at me and he said, Judge, uh, your testimony really made the difference. Your testimony was really powerful. Never having given powerful testimony, I was curious exactly what I had said. <laughs> so I wasn't going to miss the opportunity. So I said to him, really, what did I say? He liked the courts. He was a friend of the courts. He was a decent man. He said, Judge, when you told us that you were actually the third branch of government, that was very powerful. And I expect him to start smiling. And he didn't. I had a friend of mine who was Chief Justice of Maine. She's still the chief there, Lee Softly. She told me the following story. She said, one day I testified the Maine legislature. I don't mean to pick on legislators, but I have stories. <laughs> and she had testified, and they, somebody on the committee was not particularly delighted with whatever she said. Now, she's the Chief Justice of Maine. And so she said this legislator ran out of the hearing room to track her down and said, Judge, I was not happy with your testimony 
And she said, I'm, I'm sorry, you weren't. She said, who is your supervisor? I intend to call her. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson was right. Constitutionally speaking, this series this morning is really a partnership project. I just happen to have the privilege to introduce it, but I have not done the heavy lifting. It's a partnership of the New Hampshire Humanities Council, the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, this university's law school, and the about to be launched New Hampshire Institute for Civic Education in which Justice Souter has played such a critical role. This effort of constitutionally speaking is to focus on two major initiatives. One is to reform civic education in the New Hampshire public schools, K through 12, so that by the time these students graduate from high school, they'll have the requisite knowledge to be part of the civic life of their communities and their state and their nation. It is their world, and they need to be prepared to inherit it. It's also to encourage spirited and hopefully civil civic discussion among all ages. It's a very valuable and important project. I was saying to someone downstairs at the breakfast, when I was growing up, I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s, which is hard to believe since I'm only 38 years old. <laughs> But I did. I plead guilty to that. And in my childhood, there was something called a dining room table. And Sundays were different. You didn't have to look at a calendar. They felt different. We had dinner at 1 o'clock. And we talked as a family. And I listened to my parents. And sometimes it was at the kitchen table. Sometimes it would be on a ride to Cape Cod. I learned a lot by listening. American life is different now than then. It's going at a different pace. People have different time constraints. And so a lot of what was transmitted to me effortlessly is not transmitted that way now for more and more of our young people. So perhaps we need to do more and better work in our school system. And I don't say that to fault teachers. I come from a family of teachers. I have great respect for the profession of teaching. And if I didn't, my wife would not welcome me home. <laughs> so I understand the pressures of teachers. But I also understand over time, civics has been given lesser role and math and science have taken the lead, which is also important. But math and science don't keep a nation together. Civics is essential. So hopefully, you will enjoy today's session. Uh, and I will be departing after these brief remarks, which mercifully are almost done. Because as dean of a law school, my principal role, it seems, uh, is to market uh, and to secure students. So it's not as lofty as what you're going to be talking about, but it's important in my life. And so I need to head off to Boston to do that. Um, anyway, thank you for coming. It's an honor to have you at the law school. It's an honor to have the panel here and the other panels today. And with that, I'd like to introduce John Graby, who's a professor of law here at the school and who did much of, but not all of, uh, the heavy lifting to make uh, today possible. So thank you. Enjoy your day here. Thank you.